Hello there, and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. This is the second video for Chapter 6. We're talking about language processing. And you remember that in the last video, I presented several pieces of evidence for the constructional view of linguistic knowledge that had to do with studies of language comprehension. In particular, I discussed the following pieces of evidence. First, Constructions explain how speakers understand newly coined words, such as to coffee or to crutch, namely via constructional coercion effects. When you hear a novel lexical item, your interpretation of that item is guided by the constructional morphosyntactic context in which that item is embedded. Second, constructions explain why speakers categorize different sentences into the same group, say if you give them a sorting task, um, because they're influenced by similarities in constructional meaning. So the sorting results suggest that argument structure patterns carry meaning in themselves and that this meaning serves as a cue for the sortings that people come up with. Third, constructions explain knowledge of grammatical unacceptability. You know that um, you can't say things like she considered to go to the store or the awake child and you have learned this um, via the principle of statistical preemption. If you as a hearer observe that speakers repeatedly avoid one simple structure and instead go for a more complex structure, you assume that, well, they must have a reason for that. There must be a grammatical constraint that disallows the simple option. Okay, uh, here we have it, three pieces of evidence from language comprehension. And in this video, I want to move on to uh, evidence from language production. But before I do that, let me briefly add a fourth element to this list namely constructions explain the phenomenon of island constraints via principles of information packaging. Right, island constraints, that's a classic syntactic topic. It's one that um, has been believed to necessitate a purely formal syntactic explanation. Um, yeah, and so it's really the ideal test case to see whether construction grammar is a viable alternative to generative approaches to syntax. Right, I can't mention island constraints without mentioning uh, this book here, Infinite Syntax by John Robert Ross. Yeah, uh, he came up with the term island constraints and if you decide that island constraints are for you, I suggest that you, you know, go to the library, check this out. It's um, highly recommendable reading and that uh, makes you want to go back to a time in which your dissertation could be called infinite syntax. It wasn't, it was called variables on uh, constraints on variables in syntax. But infinite syntax, I don't know, the publishers probably, you know, they thought, yeah, infinite syntax. Well, okay, island constraints, what are they? Let me explain. So, your mom is on the phone again and she tells you a story about John and Mary. Mary is pregnant and the smell of certain foods gives her um, terrible nausea attacks. So your mom says the following. The smell of the scrambled eggs already made her a little queasy and then she had to run out of the kitchen because John was starting to fry. And then your train goes through a tunnel and your reception goes bad and you don't hear the last word that your mom was going to say. Okay, so you may wonder now. Um, what did Mary run out of the kitchen because John was starting to fry? But you notice that the grammar of English doesn't really allow you to ask this question. You would have to phrase it in a slightly different way. Um, so this sentence is ungrammatical. Why is it ungrammatical? Well, it violates an island constraint. I'll explain this in more detail in just a second. Um, yeah. Why would you think that this sentence is ungrammatical? There are different explanations that you could come up with, and one of these is that, well, maybe the WH word is too far away from the thing that is questioned, the object of the verb fry in this case. Yeah, maybe there's just too much material in between. 
That's a possible explanation, but it's not the right explanation because we have examples in which the distance is just as large, but they are fine. Yeah. Uh, what did your mother say that Mary's boyfriend John was starting to fry? Same distance, but a, a much better grammaticality, acceptability to it. Yeah. So length, that's not it. There's something else going on. Um, yeah. You may wonder, okay, what's going on with these islands? Yeah. <laughs> uh, why is the word island there? And island constraints. Well, it's a, it's a metaphor. Um, Hatch Ross came up with some, you know, a, a range of very neat metaphors for what was going on in, in syntax. And the basic idea here is that, okay, an island, if, if a word is on an island, it can't move. It, it, words can't swim, okay? So they're stuck on this island. And, um, well, back in the day, transformational grammar, if you form a question, the word is moved from its original position into a more prominent position where it is represented by a WH word. And this is not possible uh, if a word sits on a syntactic island. Yeah, that's it. Uh, infinite syntax. Right, so there are different syntactic constituents that are islands, um, and one of these um, are complex NPs. If you have a sentence, I just met Andy and John, Andy and John, that's a complex NP, and uh, you can't question a single part of a complex NP. So you can't form a question like, who did you just meet Andy and? Yeah. Um, compare that to simple object NPs, which are not islands. If you say, I just met John, then you can say, well, who did you just meet? If you didn't catch that right the first time. Yeah, um, so complex NPs are islands. Complex objects are islands. Um, consider the sentence, she saw the documentary about Churchill. The documentary about Churchill, that's again a complex noun phrase in object position. And, um, well, there's a prepositional phrase in there about Churchill. And notice that you can't question Churchill. Uh, you can't ask, who did you see the documentary about? Or, who did you see the documentary that was about? That doesn't work. And it's because, well, complex objects are syntactic islands. Adverbial clauses are islands. And here again we have the... Um, question that we had earlier, what did you run out of the kitchen because John was starting to fry? Well, um, it's not length that's at issue, it's that adverbial clauses, clauses that are introduced by um, an item like because, they are islands, you can't move something out of that adverbial clause and front it and question it with a WH word. Then, uh, and this is the type of island that will occupy our most of our time in, in this video here, um, at least of this first part, first part. Complements of factive verbs and manner of speaking verbs. Factive verbs realize, know, um, and manner of speaking verbs mutter, mumble, shout, scream. Those complements of, of verbs like these ones, they are islands. So. Um, I can say something like, who did she say she saw, yeah, with a so-called bridge verb, like say, um, but who did she realize she saw is a little iffy, and who did she mutter she saw is very, very weird. Okay, so factive verbs, manner of speaking verbs, their complements are syntactic islands. Okay, now you may say, okay, there are islands, Great, um, but what does this really explain? How can these restrictions on WH question formation be explained? Um, well, and there have been several explanations. Um, the first explanation that I'll discuss in a minute is a purely formal syntactic explanation, goes by the name of subjacency. And um, for a long time, this was uh, really uh, received wisdom, yeah, so <clears throat> it, it works quite well, uh, but recently two alternative explanations in a usage-based construction grammar uh, spirit have been developed. One 
based on analogy, that is uh, Eva Dabrowska's work, um, and one on information packaging, that is work that Adele Goldberg has done with Ben Ambridge, a uh, language acquisition researcher. Right, so the analogy account holds that, well, you can explain these effects in terms of a prototype and extensions from the prototype, and the, if the extensions are far enough, the sentence doesn't work. Information packaging, here the explanation is uh, made in terms of pragmatic characteristics of construction, so that backgrounded constituents, constituents that uh, express non-focal information, pragmatically presupposed information, talked about this in video number five, they are islands, and I'll explain why they should be islands. Right, but let's start with um, the classic explanation. Um, the subjacency account of island constraints holds that the filler, the WH word, I talked about filler gap constructions in the third video on the Constructicon. Uh, the filler cannot be separated from the gap, the thing that is questioned, by two or more so-called bounding nodes. And here um, you might actually question uh, Hatch Ross's wisdom whether island would be the perfect term for this. Think of it in terms of a prison that has several security systems, okay? Uh, bounding nodes are those security systems and an island has at least two of them. Yeah, so a word might wiggle through one, but it can't wiggle through two. Um, think of this example here. Who did you just meet Andy and with a complex NP? Well, you have two bounding nodes, complex NP and a sentence, and the second coordinate of Andy and John can't wiggle through both of them. Um, what did she leave the movie because John ate? So John ate popcorn, and the popcorn was kind of smelly, and Mary had to leave the movie theater uh, because John ate it. Yeah, same thing, uh, bounding notes there. Right, um, there are some problematic data associated with this account and uh, Ross actually pointed them out from, from day one, so they've been known, but well. Um, I can say something like, what did he say that he didn't bring? <clears throat> That's fine. Uh, but notice that when I replace say with a manner of speaking verb like mutter, what did he mutter that he didn't bring, the sentence crashes. So syntax is identical, verb is a little different, and there's a difference in grammar. That really shouldn't happen. If you have a dictionary in grammar model, no, no, that's problematic. Right, so Jason C, um, do yourself a favor, look it up, and um, somebody will be able to explain it a lot better than, than I am. Um, moving on to the analogy explanation. Now, the analogy explanation starts from the observation that long-distance filler gap dependencies are very, very rare in actual data. Few people outside linguistics departments ever produce them, the only exception being constructions with think and say. So things like, who did she think he's, he saw, or who did you say was on the phone? That's stuff that occurs quite frequently. Um, but everything else, you know, um, <clears throat> who did you mutter was uh, terrible to talk to, uh, that kind of stuff that's uh, just way out. Okay, um, the proposal here being that acceptability ratings should depend on similarity to a certain exemplar, a certain formula, like uh, WH word, do you think or say, and then a that clause or a bear clause. So that grammaticality corresponds to your familiarity, how often you hear something or how remote something is to things that you frequently hear. That's the analogy explanation. And, well, we'll see that there's indeed some evidence uh, for things of this kind. Now, the explanation that I want to elaborate on a little bit is the backgrounded constituents are islands hypothesis, or the BCI hypothesis advanced by Ben Ambridge and Adele Goldberg. And uh, in a nutshell, this BCI hypothesis states that the gap, yeah, the um, questioned element, must be the focus of the question. So its NP uh, must be what is asserted, 
not something that represents background information, pragmatically presupposed information. Why is that? Well, elements in long distance dependencies are positioned in discourse prominence slots. Yeah? The thing that you question has discourse prominence. And um, if you question something that belongs to a uh, constituent that is background information, you're trying to do two uh, opposite things at once. Yeah? You treat an element as backgrounded and at the same time as discourse prominent. So in a way you're saying, oh, this is really important. No, 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 it's, it's not. It's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Um, and that is pragmatically anomalous. Yeah, you're trying to do two um, very different things at once, and that doesn't work. That's the kernel of the BCI hypothesis. How can these three hypotheses be tested? Yeah. Um, well, let's see what their predictions are. What does subjacency predict? What does analogy predict? What does BCI predict? <clears throat> Uh, Ambridge and Goldberg went about to test the BCI hypothesis on the basis of two um, tests. Namely, first they asked, well, for complementating verbs like say and think and know and realize and so on and so forth, are declaratives and questions equally acceptable? And second, does the information in the complement, in the embedded clause, survive negation. Let me explain each of these tests uh, in its own terms. So, um, for this first question, are declaratives and questions equally acceptable? Uh, Ambridge and Goldberg measured a so-called difference score. So, they presented people with declarative clauses. I thought that John liked Susan. Well, it's very acceptable. Who did you think that John liked? Yeah, a corresponding question is also very acceptable. So, the difference for sentences with think is small, yeah, just one point. The difference is much larger with um, manner of speaking verbs like mumble. I mumbled that John liked Susan. Yeah, that's a fine sentence of English. Who did you mumble that John liked? Yeah, the corresponding question is not so good, not so good. So there's a large difference for mumble. If you project this on a scale where you have a coordinate system with a different score on the y-axis here, uh, then mumble would have a high difference score and think would have a lower difference score, meaning that both questions and declaratives are equally fine or equally bad, yeah, but equally fine. Right, uh, moving on to the negation test. Um, here the central question is, does the information in the embedded clause survive negation? That's a test of the extent to which a part of an utterance is backgrounded. So, um, if I tell you that the most embarrassing thing I ever did was to kiss my teacher in second grade, um, then there is some backgrounded information, namely, um, well, I kissed my teacher in second grade. Um, how do I know that? Well, uh, if somebody <clears throat> negates the sentence and says, well, if you want my opinion, that's really not the most embarrassing thing you ever did. I, I know other stories. Um, so, someone saying, well, that's not the most embarrassing thing you ever did, does not negate that I kissed my teacher in second grade, which I never have. You know. um, so, bottom line is that background information survives negation. Right, uh, we'll see more of this. Um, here, that's the instructions that Ambridge and Goldberg gave their subjects. So, um, well, when people, you have two sentences, when people say the first sentence, do they imply the second one? If you're thinking that's not the case, you know, give it a low score. If you think, yes, that's absolutely the case, you give it a high score. So, in the sentence pair, Bob left early, Bob didn't leave early. Does the first sentence imply the second one? Certainly not. Yeah, you give it a one. <clears throat> Bob left the party early. Bob left the party. Uh, does the first sentence imply that the second one is the case? Yes, absolutely. If someone left the party early, well, they left the freaking party. Yeah. So, um, third option here Bob might leave the party late. Bob left the party early. Um, if someone says Bob might leave the party late, does it imply that Bob left the party early? Hmm. Can't really tell. Yeah, 
four, somewhere in the middle, perhaps three. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so that's how um, this kind of test would work. And uh, the kinds of sentences that Ambridge and Goldberg gave their subjects were precisely these complement uh, taking predicates like think and examples with mumble and so on and so forth. So when people say, I don't think that John has left, do they mean to say that John hasn't left? Yeah, do they mean that? And if so, give them a high score. <clears throat> if they say, I didn't mumble that John had left, do they mean that John had not left? Probably not. So you give them a low score. Right. Uh, again, imagine that you have different verbs and you uh, project the results again on scale with different people giving slightly different ratings. Then you would have a negation score where think has a very high negation score. Yeah, because negation survives. Um, and uh, mumble would have a very low negation score. Negation doesn't survive. Okay. Um, now the predictions of the BCI are as follows. The negation test measures backgroundedness. If the second sentence survives the negation of the main clause, then that's evidence that it's backgrounded and, here's the important point, it should be a syntactic island. Yeah? The BCI predicts that verbs that score low on the negation test, uh, like mumble, will have a high difference score. Yeah, so that the questions will be a lot worse than the declaratives. And so there should be a negative correlation between these two tests, the uh, um, different score and the negation test. The higher the negation score, yeah, uh, think has a high negation score, the lower the different score should be. So the more acceptable the long distance dependencies. Now, did people find that? Um, this is what is expected, mumble having a high difference score and a low negation score, think having a high negation score but a low difference score. And um, Ambridge and Goldberg did this not only for two verbs but instead for a whole lot of complement taking verbs. Um, right, we'll come back to this, keep this in mind. Um, what are the predictions of subjacency, the classic syntactic account? Well, here um, with regard to these tests, um, subjacency would predict that structurally identical sentences should receive identical ratings, or at least similar ratings. Yeah? So what do you think that John liked should be rated just as what did you believe that John liked. <clears throat> the predictions of analogy, by contrast, are such that verbs that deviate more strongly from the prototype should receive greater scores in the difference rating. So what do you think John liked? Low difference score. What did you believe that John liked? A slightly higher difference score. What did you notice that John liked? A higher still uh, difference score. Okay, so uh, some 70 participants got a questionnaire um, where they were exposed to little tasks of this kind and a verb class was operationalized as a variable with three levels. Um, so there were factive verbs like realize, remember, notice and know. Uh, manner of speaking verbs, whisper, stammer, mumble, mutter, shout and so on and so forth. And so-called bridge verbs, say, decide, think and believe. Right. Um, Ambridge and, and, and Goldberg took the different score. So the um, measures of declarative and question, uh, acceptability ratings, and the negation test judgment, um, whether or not negation survives in you know, this inference task. Right, and here are some results. Um, <clears throat> and what you see here are differences between the three different types of verbs that Ambridge and Goldberg included in their study. Factive verbs like no, manner of speaking verbs like mumble, and bridge verbs like say. And um, you see that in the negation test, it was actually bridge verbs that had the highest scores. And conversely, uh, in the difference test, 
bridge verbs have the lowest rating. So we see that this negative correlation that Ambridge and Goldberg hypothesized, you know, you, you see it in this graph. One, the bars go up. One, uh, the, the other one, the bars go down. So good news so far. Um, also, if you plot the results for all individual verbs, you uh, you see these negative correlation. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, no has a low uh, scale, a low rating in the negation test. Uh, so when you say, I didn't know that John had left, um, that um, does not imply that you mean John had not left. Um, and the difference score is high. Um, <clears throat> so there's a large uh, difference between uh, a declarative, the acceptability of a declarative sentence and the acceptability of a corresponding question. Now with think, uh, I don't think has, that John has left, that leads people to think, okay, this person means John has not left, so it has a high score on the negation test, but it has a low difference score, meaning that declarative sentences with think and questions with think are just as fine. Right. Um, <clears throat> so here are the, uh, okay, the, that's for the uh, question uh, declarative difference score. I knew that John liked Susan is better than who did you know that John liked. Whereas I thought that John liked Susan is just about as good as who did you think that John liked. Right. Um, so the uh, predictions of the BCI are borne out. Uh, what about subjacency? Well, subjacency does not predict the observed results. In order to account for the difference between the different verb classes, subjacency would have to stipulate that factive verb complements and manner of speaking uh, complements have a special syntactic status. In other words, you ha would have to fiddle with the lexical entries in order to predict these results. And as I said, this is slightly difficult with a dictionary and grammar kind of setup. Uh, what about analogy? Analogy doesn't fare that badly on these tests. So it correctly predicts that think and say should be the most acceptable verbs. So if you uh, look again here, think and say and decide have the lowest difference scores. So those are um, yeah, the, <clears throat> the most acceptable ones. Um, however, it is uh, is it the case that WH question with think and say are stored as syntactic templates? That is an open question. And um, in order to address this question, Emrich and Goldberg did a little semantic similarity study. So 12 students filled out um, questionnaires with semantic similarity assessments. Yeah, um, You see the stimuli, how dissimilar are the following verbs to think in the context of did you think that Mary needed the map? Um, so did you think that Mary needed the map as opposed to did you decide that Mary needed the map? Um, quite different I would say. Did you say that Mary needed the map? A bit more like that. Yeah. <laughs> did you whisper that Mary needed the map? Very different. Very. Right, so that's what people did. And um, the results were that there was really no significant correlation between the diff scores from the first study, yeah, the y-axis, and the similarity ratings from the similarity experiment. Hence, there's not that much evidence for the idea that acceptability declines as verbs become less and less similar to say and think. So this detracts, in some measure, from the analogy account. Uh, but, of course, uh, Eva Dabrowska did some follow-up studies that show that, well, there really is further evidence for the analogy account. So um, go to her webpage if this interests you and you know, download the papers and uh, check this out because it's really, really interesting stuff. Okay, um, the overall conclusions then are that the BCI, the background constituents or islands hypothesis, correctly and accurately predicts the island status of clausal complements which means that the discourse functions of constructions, the information packaging of constructions, rather than purely formal generalizations, such as subjacency, play a critical role in the acceptability of syntactic structures. And that is 
pretty amazing. Um, right, so we have a fourth item on our list of uh, pieces of evidence from language processing constructions explain island constraints via principles of information packaging. There we have it. And now, after this lengthy introduction, we can come to language production. What evidence for construction grammar is there if we look at studies of language production? First item, constructions explain reduction effects in speech. Now, um, studies of speech show over and over again that highly predictable words are reduced. If you say something like, I'd like, to, I'd like a gin and tonic, please, the and is hardly audible as such, yeah, because it's so predictable. What other word is going to occur between gin and tonic? Um, compare that to, I'd like a gin and a cucumber sandwich, please. Yeah. <laughs> I've never ordered a gin and a cucumber sandwich, but probably I should, yeah. Um, so in the first sentence, and barely audible, in the second one, you need to pronounce it. This effect is observed not only at the level of word strings, but also at the level of construction. So words are reduced when they occur in a construction for which they are highly typical. Um, let me uh, tell you about a study that uh, Susanne Gahl and Susan Garnsey uh, did, it appeared in Language in 2004, where they looked at, again, complementing verbs like suggest and maintain. Um, all right, they gave people uh, sentences to read, yeah, and the cover story was, yeah, we need these sentences for a psychology experiment. Little did people know that they were actually in the psychology experiment, but well, um, they were told afterwards, so no worries. Right, um, now imagine yourself reading these sentences. The director suggested the scene should be filmed at night, and the director suggested the scene between Kim and Mike. Um, <clears throat> Here, it turned out that speakers produced the verb suggested shorter in one sentence than in another. Can you guess which one? Well, um, actually, in the first one, production times were shorter. Yeah, and why? Why should this be? Well, it's because suggest very frequently occurs in this kind of construction with a that-less complement clause. Yeah? The director suggested and then a clause. Um, if we look at the other two examples, yeah, the confident engineer maintained the machinery of the whole upper deck and the confident engineer maintained the machinery would be hard to destroy. It's exactly the other way around. So uh, here um, <clears throat> the maintained uh, of the first sentence was produced um, in, a, in a more reduced fashion, yeah, because maintained, um, maintain frequently occurs in the transitive construction with the nominal object, it occurs less frequently uh, with that clause construction. So here the other structural variant was produced in a reduced fashion. Clever study. I, I really like it. So this means that there's a constructional bias of the verb which significantly correlates with reduced pronunciation. So verbs like argue, believe, claim, conclude, confess, and decide, which are conventionally associated with complement clauses, they're complex complementing constructions, they're produced shorter when they occur with such clauses, and verbs such as accept, advocate, confirm, or emphasize, they are reduced when they occur with a direct object, and they're produced longer when they occur in an unusual construction with a that clause. So, what's cool about this is that the reduction effect cannot be explained through the mere routinization of word strings. Yeah, that would be the classic Bybian explanation when something's reduced well that's because you've practiced it a lot and it rolls off the tongue like that well um, in a way it does but notice that um, here in um, the director suggested the scene that could be any noun yeah? it could be any noun starting any sentence and so um, 
it cannot be just about routinization of phonetic material. It has to be about routinization of constructions, which are structural and not just phonetic. Okay, um, moving on to a second point. Constructions explain syntactic priming and also exceptions to syntactic priming. Syntactic priming. That's a, um, well, in a nutshell, syntactic priming is if you have recently heard a syntactic structure, you are likely to reuse it if an opportunity presents itself. So, for instance, if you're giving, if you're given a sentence like this one here, the referee was punched by one of the fans. Yeah, you encounter that sentence, and afterwards, a friendly psychologist asks you to describe this picture. Yeah. You're actually likely to use a passive construction and says, oh, that church was hit by lightning. Because you were primed with a passive. Yeah? So here you have the passive. And um, <clears throat> so after being primed with a passive, you're more likely to use that passive if an occasion presents itself, which it does here. Um, another prime. Uh, the undercover agent sold some cocaine to the rock star. If you're being primed with this and afterwards uh, you're being asked to describe this situation, you're actually more likely to say, oh, the um, granddad, the grandperson, uh, read a story to the child instead of the grandfather read the grandchild, the story, the ditransitive construction. It would work just as well, yeah? But since you're being primed with the prepositional date of construction, you're more likely to use that in the description of this picture. Okay, that's syntactic priming. And there are different factors at play in syntactic priming. Um, Stefan Gries has written about this also. Uh, Benedikt Smashani has written about this. Um, there is something called lexical boost. So syntactic priming is especially strong, especially effective, if it is supported by the recurrence of the same main verb. Yeah. Um, so one ditransitive with give, if there is another giving event, then you're very, very likely to reuse the ditransitive with give. There's also a production boost, so syntactic priming is more effective, is especially strong, if the speaker has produced the prime herself or himself, and not just heard it. And then, of course, there is transience, that is, syntactic priming wears off with time. Um, so, when you hear a prepositional dative, the likelihood of reusing a prepositional dative goes up for a certain amount of time, and then it levels off again to the baseline likelihood of using a prepositional dative instead of a ditransitive. Right. Um, <clears throat> um, now, in this study that Stefan Gries did, he noticed that um, <clears throat> in a study of ditransitives and prepositional datives, um, there are curious things going on with different verbs, so that verbs like send and lend show strong priming effects. Yeah? So they typically occur in sentences that instantiate the construction that is used in the prime. Strong priming effects for send and lend, but um, with certain verbs there is an absence of priming. Uh, for instance, show, offer, and give typically occur in the ditransitive construction regardless of the construction that is used before. Yeah? So there, in a way, priming is not strong enough or doesn't kick in. Um, sell and hand typically occur in prepositional dative constructions, regardless of the construction in which they were used before. So also there, yeah, no priming effect. What's going on? Um, the short and the long of it is that constructions have collocational preferences. So ditransitive um, verbs, typical ditransitive verbs are show, offer, and give. Um, and these collocational preferences may neutralize syntactic prime. So even though you've recently heard a prepositional dative, you're still choosing a ditransitive because the collocational preferences of show, offer, and give outweigh the priming effect. Yeah. Um, 
Moving on to the third and final point, constructions explain how speakers complete sentences. Um, okay, for this I have to back up a little. Uh, listeners constantly anticipate what will come next. If you listen to me like you do now, you constantly try to finish my sentence before I actually finish them. Yeah? <laughs> so listeners recognize parts of constructions and they anticipate how speakers will finish their utterances. And from a processing perspective, this is uh, very, very advantageous. Um, <clears throat> and a common phenomenon when you look at actual transcribed speech is that people co-construct their utterances. Um, so they already know what their um, interlocutor is going to say, and quite often they finish that person's sentences when that person runs into processing difficulties. Happens to me all the time. It, it does happen to other people as well. Okay, um, so question. What counts as a cue for projection? This is called projection. And how reliable are those cues? So, if you have a first half of a sentence like, the more I think about it, then you have a very, very strong cue that this is the um, the X or the wire construction, the comparative correlative. Yeah, the more I think about it, you know that what's going to happen in the second half is something like, yeah, the more, uh, the less I understand, something like that. Um, now, in the second example here, the committee shall, well, you, you know that, okay, some kind of infinitive is going to be there. The committee shall be there, it shall uh, decide on something like that. Um, but which verb is actually cued by shall? Yeah? And there are several possibilities that you could entertain. I mean, uh, the frequent, most frequent verb after shall is the copula B. Yeah? Uh, these are figures from the, from the B and C. Um, shall be some 2,000 examples in the B and C. Shall consider 200 examples in the B and C. Um, does that mean that shall cues B 10 times more strongly than it cues consider? Well, that is questionable because if you look at the overall frequencies of the copula B, which is half a million, and uh, the verb consider in an infinitive, that's just 7,600, it turns out that shall consider is surprisingly frequent. Yeah? Um, out of 7,600, 200 are preceded by shall. That is way more than 2,000 out of 500,000 for B. So, um, what determines Q validity? Um, hypothesis 1, simple relative frequencies. Yeah? You count and whatever gets the most hits that's what we're queuing. Or hypothesis two, surprisingly high frequencies. And um, Gries and uh, Stefan Gries and colleagues investigated which verbs prompted speakers to use a construction that is called the as predicative. Um, I see myself as a cognitive functional grammarian. Uh, that's something that is on my webpage. Um, so that's the as predicative. And uh, they investigated which verbs prompted speakers to use this construction. Um, so, <clears throat> here are some actual examples of the as predicative. The proposal was considered as rather provocative. I've never seen myself as being too thin, or California is perceived as a place where everything is possible. Um, and uh, there are very strong cues for the as predicative. So if I begin a sentence saying that the idea was hailed, then you kind of know, okay, as the next big thing. Um, I have never seen, that doesn't really cue you into uh, myself as being too thin. So there are strong cues for the as predicative, weak cues to the as predicative. And uh, what uh, Stefan Gries and his colleagues were interested in was, okay, which ones um, cue the as predicative most strongly. Um, they did a study with four different types of verb. Um, 
high frequency verbs and low frequency verbs. Um, so high frequency verbs are things like define, describe, know, recognize, regard, see, use, view, keep, leave, refer to, and show. And then low frequency verbs, acknowledge, class, conceive, denounce, depict, diagnose, hail, rate, build, choose, claim, intend, offer, present, represent, suggest. All right. Uh, but they had another factor, namely not frequency as such, but surprisingly high frequency or surprisingly low frequency. And they measured this with um, something that's called colostructional analysis. I should probably do a video about colostructional analysis at some point, but um, well, for now, it suffices for you to, to know that, okay, we have frequency as one factor crossed with surprisingly high or surprisingly low frequency as another factor. And the question now is, um, is the raw frequency hypothesis right? And these verbs cue strongly for the as predicative and these don't? Or is it rather the case that these surprisingly high frequency verbs cue the as predicative and the surprisingly low frequency ones don't, even though there may be high frequency verbs uh, if we look at relative frequency? Right, um, so they did a study and had people complete sentences and what you see here is that some verbs yielded a high rate of sentence completion in the as predicative construction. Yeah, so roughly 45-48% of the subjects of the participant completed a stimulus with an as predicative, and some of uh, and and two other types of verbs patterned uh, in a slightly lower fashion, so 12% and 16% and continued with an S predicative. Now, which hypothesis is borne out? Is it the colostructional hypothesis or the raw frequency hypothesis? If you look at these four squares, you see that these two pattern together, the surprisingly high frequency verbs, and these two pattern together, yeah, the surprisingly low frequency verbs. So this suggests that it's actually not frequency measured uh, as such, but it is surprisingly high frequency or surprisingly low frequency that yields people, uh, that, that makes people respond in a certain way. Okay, now that gives us three pieces of evidence from language production. First of all, constructions explain reduction effects in speech. Um, verbs are reduced if they occur in constructions for which they are highly typical. Uh, second, constructions explain syntactic priming and exceptions to syntactic priming. If you hear a syntactic pattern, you're likely to reuse that again. But if your construction has strong collocational preferences, then these collocational preferences um, outweigh your urge to you know, reuse the construction. And thirdly, constructions explain how speakers complete sentences. That's it for today. Um, in the next video, we'll move on to uh, language acquisition, which also is an important topic and really fits in well with uh, the other things I've said about construction grammar and language processing. All right.